Um, yes, I'm Professor Liz Ritchie and I'm with the Department of Atmospheric Sciences and I've been studying tropical cyclones, which, of which hurricanes are a subset, um, for about the past, actually I don't know whether I want to date myself, but about the past 25 years or so. I first started studying them um, when I did my dissertation uh, at Monash University in Australia. And in case you hadn't noticed, I do have a, yes, a little bit of an accent. And I sometimes say weird words, so if I do, um, just remind me. I wanted to introduce you, just to start off, to my research group and, and talk just for a couple of slides about the type of research that we do. And then we'll get in just a little bit more into a little bit of general information about hurricanes or tropical cyclones. And then actually I just want to launch into, into the 2014 season since that's kind of relevant to us and has been a hot topic. So this is my current group, it, it fluctuates. Um, a number of graduate students at the University of Arizona studying for either their masters or their PhDs. Um, I do have non-ATMO, ATMO is our, um, our acronym, and I do have non-ATMO collaborators. Um, one of the main ones is Professor Tayo from Optical Sciences and a couple of postdoctoral scholars. And, um, a, a reasonable amount of what I will show you today um, has been um, part of uh, Kim, Dr. Kim Wood's uh, research when she was a PhD student under me. The types of things that we do when we're studying tropical cyclones um, in my group is we look at um, structure and structure change. And when we're talking about structure, we're talking about the entire wind field and rain field of the tropical cyclone, not just what the single point intensity value might be, but how does the whole wind field fluctuate? And that's very important because it's the total wind field that drives things like the storm surge um, and, and actually is where the damage potential lies is in the entire wind field. Um, and you can get very significant structure changes because of environmental interactions and sometimes because of interactions inside the tropical cyclone itself. We look at their attributes from satellite. Tropical cyclones spend most of their lives over the ocean and it's really hard to take measurements in them um, when they're over the ocean because launching a balloon or, or putting a, um, a surface-based observation system, uh, you just can't float it on the water. You need to have land in order to launch those kinds of, of measurements. So most of the observations and most of the most consistent observations we get of, tro of tropical cyclones, of hurricanes, is from satellite now. Prior to the late 1960s and early 70s when the satellites were launched, um, we didn't see a lot of the tropical cyclones that were out there. And in fact, the count of tropical cyclones for the eastern and north Pacific doubled after the advent of satellites because now we could see a lot of cyclones we couldn't see before. Um, so we rely on satellites and, and many other factors. And so we do a lot of research in trying to extract those kinds of signals from satellite. Um, Extratropical transition. Tropical cyclones don't spend their whole time in the tropics and a, a large percentage of them move up into the mid-latitudes, interact with the mid-latitude flow, and become, can become quite powerful um, hybrid storms after they interact with the mid-latitudes. Um, I don't know if any of you saw the, the movie The Perfect Storm. That was a weather system that uh, was originally a tropical cyclone. It then moved up into the mid-latitudes and interacted with an upper-level trough in the mid-latitudes and became a very power extra, powerful extra-tropical cyclone. And so trying to understand how that interaction works and why the system becomes the type of structure that it does afterwards is very important. We also look at landfall impacts. Obviously, for, for, human, um, uh, for human needs, we need to understand um, the types of, of, of destructiveness, if you like, that a tropical cyclone will impart when it makes landfall. Trying to understand, because of various types of coastline, topography and various other factors for, for locales, for individual locales, um, how the tropical cyclone will change as it makes landfall and how it will impact those areas is very important. And that incorporates not just the physical attributes of the tropical cyclone itself, but it's also very important to understand the economic and the social structure of the area um, in order to understand how these are going to impact and how you can um, help to mitigate those impacts. We study the tropical cyclones through a number of uh, different methodologies. We use very sophisticated weather models um, in order to try and understand how they uh, change, how their internal workings uh, kind of uh, interact with, 
with the environment or with other weather systems. We use uh, satellite-based remote sensing to try and extract signals and also simply to try and track and, and understand how the, the evolution of the cloud structures occurs. We use um, long-term data sets that are available. These are model-based, but they typically have uh, all the observations that were available at the time incorporated into them to give you the very best estimate of what the atmosphere looked like. So you can use these kinds of data sets, and they go back, some of them go back 40 or 50 years, some of them go back 100 years, um, in order to try and understand long-term variability of tropical cyclones, and how maybe as the environment is changing over many decades, how that impacts tropical cyclones. Um, and then we also look at their rainfall patterns as well, using statistical analysis. And then finally, because they spend most of their time over the ocean and you can't launch balloons into them and take measurements that way, the only other way we can take proper, um, valid, in situ measurements is to fly into them. Things like aircraft, drones, um, various other types of instruments like that we actually use to fly into them uh, to try and study them in, in very uh, comprehensive and yes, very expensive field experiments where we try to take very comprehensive observations of single systems so that we can try and understand better how they work. So, the very first point that I want to make, and I'm, I'm not going to belabor this too much, but the fact is that tropical cyclones, of which hurricanes are a subset, are socially and economically the most destructive phenomena, natural phenomena on the Earth. They account for, this includes uh, earthquakes, volcanoes, any other natural sort of disaster you can think of. They account for 14% of the hazards, but they account for 26% of the economic damage, and that's based on data um, up to 2014 from the World Bank and the International Disaster Database. They account for almost 50% of all weather disasters, but almost 70% of the human impact of those same disasters. So they, it is really important to understand them. The types of hazards that, and these actually aren't all encompassing, but the types of hazards that you, you would incur from a tropical cyclone um, are wind damage type hazards, and these would include the impacts of um, the most intense winds upon landfall um, and also the extent of the damaging winds as a tropical cyclone makes landfall. It also includes the wind damage associated with, for example, tornadoes that form within the rain bands of the tropical cyclone. So any type of wind phenomena associated with a landfall in tropical cyclone um, is included in wind hazards. Um, you also have the rain hazards, and this kind of gets separated out. We call this the freshwater hazard, or the freshwater flooding associated with the intense rainfall that you get out of tropical cyclones. And then you, and then you have another aspect of, of water damage, which is the storm surge, which is the, um, the part of the tropical cyclone that drives the ocean up into the land. And this tends to have a much more local, coastal effect from storm surge. This doesn't tend to extend too far inland compared with both of these hazards that can actually extend quite a long way inland as they follow along with the remnants of the tropical cyclone after it makes landfall. The other type of hazard that you might um, get from a tropical cyclone would be out at sea, for example. Tropical cyclones can generate quite high waves. And particularly the types of storms that go extra tropical. Um, the perfect storm, again, was another classic example of um, where you could, uh, uh, I think, measured about 100 foot waves driven by the winds of these uh, extratropical systems. And that uh, poses a very large hazard for shipping, for example. The basic tropical cyclone anatomy that uh, leads to these, um, these types of hazards, I want to just go over them really quickly here. And so I'm, I'll go in a little bit detail of what these two pictures are, and there's actually another picture that we'll let overlay here as well. This is the um, extracted surface wind field, analyzed surface wind field for a tropical cyclone. And the most inten intense winds in a tropical cyclone are at the surface. The winds drop off with height as you move away from the surface. So this is where the damaging winds are going to be. And of course, since that's where we live, that's where we're going to see the impact anyway. What you're seeing here in green, of course, this is, um, this is rotating counterclockwise, this is a northern hemisphere tropical cyclone. It would go the other way if we're in the southern hemisphere. The greens are winds that are less than 35 knots, which is about 40 miles per hour. And this contour here is delineating where the, um, the 40 mile per hour winds are located in this system. 
So anything inside of that is getting stronger than 40 miles per hour. Um, as you go into the sort of golds and yellows, you're hitting uh, 50 knots or about 58 miles per hour. And finally, you're seeing in here in the reds the most intense winds in this particular system. This wasn't the most intense system out there, but you kind of get the idea that the winds are very strong in, in this annulus around the centre, and they drop off as you move out away. The damaging winds in this system would be essentially within this 35 knot contour. So you can see that there's quite a, a kind of spatial extent to the winds that can cause damage on the ground after a cyclone makes landfall. It's not about where the centre hits. It's about where all these winds hit when you make landfall. So you, get a, so you get this spatial extent of damage occurring because of the spatial extent of the wind field. And then inside of here, the winds drop off again as you go into the centre of the tropical cyclone, you have a calm eye. Okay. So that would be something that was very, fairly, uh, fairly well known that we tend to have not quite zero winds in the centre of a tropical cyclone, but certainly quite calm winds in the centre. Where you have the strongest uh, backscatter from ice, that's where you have the strongest thunderstorms. So we can really see here that um, outside of this calm eye region, we have this, this rip of very intense thunderstorms, and this delineates the eye wall. And then we also have a spiral rain band extending out from the centre. So this area here would be where the strongest, most intense winds are, and this would be co-located with where the most intense thunderstorms and therefore the most intense rainfall is located as well. But you also get very strong rainfall in the rain band, but this would be the most intense rainfall area. You're essentially looking at the same thing here in the colours, and all you can see now is um, the white stuff is looking at an infrared cloud image so you would be able to, so you can kind of see where the, the extent of the cloudiness associated with this tropical cyclone is located. This happens to be ideal by the way. This is not what this is. Where it's just about to make landfall on uh, the Baja Peninsula. So with the cloudiness it's a little bit harder to see that structure that's underneath. Um, but you can see that there's a larger extent of cloudiness. There is the faint hint of a, an eye, a clear eye in here as well. But the microwave really gives you that signal of what's where the real thunderstorms are much better than the, the infrared image does. But again, just a reminder, so the strongest winds are located right around the centre of the storm. The strongest rainfall is also located there. But then you have this spatial extent of the damaging winds that's fairly important. Just to give you an idea of where tropical cyclones occur and where they don't, um, this is a, a picture of the tracks of tropical cyclones going back to about 1900. Um, and you can see that they occur in a number of basins. They occur in the tropical regions of the world, but there are some places where they distinctly don't occur. Right? They don't occur right on the equator, and that's because they require Coriolis force in order to actually spin up into a hurricane or a tropical cyclone. And Coriolis is zero on the equator. So they do not form on the equator, and that's something that forecasters hang their hats on. But they do, uh, they do form within about five degrees. So if you, once you're about five degrees from the equator, they can form. Uh, they form in the Indian North Ocean, south and north. They form in the South Pacific, Southwest Pacific, um, everywhere in the North Pacific. They don't form in the Southeast Pacific, and they really don't form in the South Atlantic Ocean but they do form obviously in the North Atlantic Ocean. There are environmental reasons why they don't form here and here. The conditions are just not conducive. The, tropical, the uh, sea surface temperatures are cooler and um, big tropical systems, they actually draw their energy from the very warm tropical <coughs> ocean. So that's why they do form over the oceans in the tropical regions. The other thing to notice with this picture is that you have a very high density of tracks here in the Western North Pacific. This is actually the basin of the highest um, amount of tropical cyclones every year. They, except for just in recent times, they would have th over 30 tropical cyclones form. The Eastern North Pacific is also a very high density region and it's the second highest um, basin for tropical cyclone development. Just zero in on that a little bit more. Since this is what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the Eastern North Pacific mostly. Um, so you can see how, how very dense these tracks are. Again, this is over 100 years of tracks, um, but that's still pretty impressive. And there's a couple of other things you can tease out of this picture. Um, they do form 
in here, right off the coast of Mexico. In fact, it's the highest density region for tropical cyclone genesis in the world. So if you want to go out there and fly a field experiment to try and understand why they form, this is where you go, because this is where, not only is it close to the coast, but it's where you're most likely to get them forming during the period that you're out there. And then once they form, the tracks move predominantly to the west. And that's simply because the large scale steering flow of the atmosphere is mostly easterly, so it drives them toward the west, particularly in the, the main part of the season in the summer and in the very early fall. But you all notice that there are some tracks that tend to move north. Um, and these are the ones that are of interest for the southwest US. Um, they predominantly occur a little later in the season, and that's because um, as you move into sort of um, the middle of fall and late fall, the middle latitudes are starting to move back south again, the middle latitude flow, and you start to get interactions with upper level troughs, and these are going to steer the tropical cyclones more northward, and, and in some cases cause extra tropical transition to occur. This is showing you a time series of just, just numbers of tropical cyclones, just simple counts of how many tropical cyclones have formed in the eastern North Pacific. And this is just going back to 1980. You can take this type of a time series back to uh, 1900 if you want. Um, you can see that there's a lot of variability in there. Um, but there's also a little bit of a, a longer scale variability in there if you, um, you can plot some trend lines on there. If you plot just a linear trend line from 1980, so this is a, just a little bit, um, you can't completely take this home, let's just say, really need to go back further in time to properly see what's going on here. But if you start from 1980 and you plot a trend line, it looks like the linear trend line is going, it's kind of going down in activity. And the main reason for that is that we have had this lull in activity um, from about the late 1990s through about 2010. But if you plot a polynomial, then you get a little bit more structure in there and you can see it looks like we might be, thanks to this year really, we might be on an upswing in activity. But uh, at least for the last eight to 10 years, we've been pretty quiet compared with the normal for the Eastern North Pacific. In terms of during the season, how does the activity pan out if you're looking month to month to see how, how much uh, tropical cyclone activity you're going to get in the Eastern North Pacific? And if you look at the orange histogram, um, this is going to tell you what the 20 year average tells you is kind of the seasonal activity. And this shows you that the peak of the season is in about August, but really July through September is when your main activity is going to happen in the eastern North Pacific. Again, this is just tropical cyclones in general. If you look at the green, these are the land falling tropical cyclones. These are um, counts of not just full land, uh, tropical cyclones that make landfall, but also in many cases, we get remnants of tropical cyclones making landfall, either in Mexico um, or on the west coast of the US or into the southwest US. And when you look at those, the green histogram, you can see that it's skewed to the later part of the season. So for landfall in tropical cyclone remnants, the peak of the season is kind of September. And then you still have a lot of activity relative to the um, main tropical cyclone population going into October just a picture of when tropical cyclones do make landfall in Mexico because of the steep terrain, the very complex topography they have, they have uh, very severe impacts actually, more severe than, than we really see in the US. But why would I stop I actually always get asked this, why do I study tropical cyclones? Why don't I come to Tucson to study tropical cyclones? Well, maybe I didn't exactly come to Tucson to study tropical cyclones. I came to Tucson for a job, but, uh, but tropical cyclones are actually um, a fascinating thing to study here. And one of the reasons for that is that when we do get one, the impacts can be quite severe. Okay? And actually up until this year, when I showed this picture, I would ask people if they recognized this place, and they wouldn't be able to answer me, at least the younger, younger audiences wouldn't be able to answer me. They couldn't recognize what was going on here or here. Of course, this year um, we've had a little bit more impacts, and so you might understand a little bit better that we actually do get tropical cyclones in Tucson. But this was an, this was an event that happened back in 1983, and this was actually a one-two wane. So there was actually a tropical cyclone that came through a week before Octave, and it rained and it saturated the ground. 
So that a week later when Dave came through, the rain just ran off and it ran off into the rivers. And you see we actually had uh, the maximum rainfall amounts of about 12 inches. And uh, it, it filled the rivers and the rivers overflowed and actually had record flow amounts in both the Rinito and the Santa Cruz for this event. Um, caused a lot of destruction, the bike path got wiped out, uh, the banks got eroded away, structures fell into the river. There was quite a lot of damage. There was, um, I can't remember what the total damages were now, it's just not on the top of my head. Um, but the river was completely recarved during this event. There's actually various other ecological things that happened during this event. But the river was completely recarved so that when we actually got higher flows, we actually, the record flows aren't this event anymore. The record flows are actually um, from an event in 2006, not a hurricane event. But the river could contain that water for the 2006 event, even though the flows were actually higher because the river had been completely recarved out and had a higher capacity after this event. But certainly this was, um, this took out, um, what took out the bike path, it took out the Prince Road Bridge over the Santa Cruz, which never got rebuilt. Um, and, and, the, and the point really is that not only do we get record floods associated with these events, the rainfall happens in a very short period of time. And this rainfall can often be um, 50%, 100% of our warm season rainfall. It happens only in about two or three days. So you get very high rainfall amounts and obviously very um, high consequences for, for flooding. They're also extremely difficult to predict. Extremely difficult. Well, how important is this rainfall? So Octave was obviously a very dramatic, it's probably the most dramatic example that there is out there for Tucson, but we have had others. Um, this is showing you the total tropical cyclone rainfall from a period of about 14 years. And these are in millimetres. Um, and you can see that certainly the rainfall associated with tropical cyclones is mostly concentrated on the west coast of Mexico. But we do see these two kind of maxima. And these are all from tropical cyclones in the east and north Pacific. We're not counting Gulf of Mexico tropical cyclones here. Um, and you can see that in Tucson, um, we actually can get quite a bit of rainfall, a bit of a minimum in New Mexico, but New Mexico, actually the rainfall from these tropical cyclones is actually also quite important. And then you get this other maxima in, in Texas along the Gulf Coast, mostly because as these systems transfer this way, they pick up some moisture from the Gulf of Mexico. To focus on just this image so I can move forward, and what this is showing you, this is showing you the percentage of warm season rainfall due to tropical cyclones in just one year. We just picked 1993. It happened to have a couple of tropical cyclones make landfall. But what you can see that is in, in one particular year, you had 50% of the warm season rainfall was due to tropical cyclones. So you can see that they're fairly important in enhancing uh, the warm season rainfall. So if you look at 2014, <coughs> this was quite a dramatic year for us. There were, there had been, we are still actually in the tropical cyclone season. It hasn't ended yet. Okay. Not officially and, and probably not, not unofficially either. We've had 20 tropical cyclones and they're all shown here. And you can see that some of them have um, had quite westward tracks associated with them. And quite a few of them have had this more northward track associated with them. And let's see, here is Norbert. Uh, here is Odile and uh, this blue one here is Simon, which are the three that have actually impacted us. This one is um, Genevieve. This one was an interesting one and a very unusual tropical cyclone. It actually formed, it went to the west, it went past Hawaii, it kept going, it kept going, it went into the western North Pacific. It turned around, it kept going, it kept going, and finally came back again. Um, and that's very unusual. We've only had four or five handful of cases that have actually managed to do that. Nine major hurricanes, six hurricanes, five tropical storms, and one unnamed tropical depression. That's, uh, that's uh, a pretty active year. And in fact, that's encapsulated here. Th these two figures both show essentially the same thing. <coughs> so, <coughs> so I'm just gonna focus on this one on the left. This is counting the number of cyclone days. So if a tropical cyclone exists on a particular day, that counts as one. If two tropical cyclones exist on that same day, that counts as two. 
And if the one tropical cyclone only exists for two days, that counts for two. So you accumulate these days from the start of the season onwards, and you compare them, you can compare them with what the average is over a 30-year period. And that's what the histogram is. And now we're comparing the three basins, the North Atlantic, the Eastern North Pacific, and the Central North Pacific, where Hawaii is. You see that the Central North Pacific doesn't typically get much activity compared with the other two basins. Uh, and the Eastern North Pacific is typically a little more active than the North Atlantic. You need to get more tropical cyclones in the Eastern North Pacific on average. This is the timeline of the accumulated cyclone days for the Eastern North Pacific. And we're about 130% of normal up till now. The North Atlantic is about 60 to 70% of normal. They've been very inactive this year, even with a couple of cyclones they just had. And the Central North Pacific is about 200% of normal. So the Eastern North Pacific has definitely been unusual in its activity, which probably leads, you know, it probably means that it's been unusual in the environment it's been supplying to the tropical cyclones. But definitely more active than normal and still going. Highlights so far, it's the most active season since 2006. First category five hurricane since 2010, and Marie was extremely intense, almost a record. I haven't actually looked to see if it was a record. The most major hurricane since 1993, and three TC landfalling remnants in the US Southwest region. So these are the highlights. And just thought we'd take a quick look at each of those three landfall and tropical cyclones just to kind of finish up here. And so we had Norbert, and Norbert looked very impressive out in the satellite image. It did this wonky kind of a track where it looped around and then it came back in and then it kind of looked like it dissipated, but its remnants came on in and gave us rainfall. Of course, Phoenix was very hard hit, you might all remember. Uh, this is I-10. And this is a loop of sort of the last couple of days of, of Norbert. So I'll just let you there. So here are the tropical, here are the remnants. This dissipates and this one band um, of moisture plumes into Arizona right over Phoenix. And that's why you've got that very intense rainfall in Phoenix. So a couple more pictures here. This is, uh, I think this was Mesa. That's, that's a basketball hoop. Not, a, not, not one of those plastic ones you have in your backyard either. <laughs> And then I turn again, that's, this is a flag, this is a sign for flag stuff. Uh, I, saw, I saw somewhere there was a description from one person who said they were driving on I-10 and they were hit by a wall of water. So it came very fast. Odile, of course, Odile was considered a washout here, uh, in the negative sense. Um, again, looked very impressive on satellite. Um, took a track that went right up. It's very, in, actually very interesting how it managed to hold itself together so well as it traversed the, um, it just went right up the spine of the um, Baja Peninsula and then it went across and it actually re-intensified a little bit as it, it crossed the very warm waters in the uh, Gulf of California and then of course it came into um, northern Mexico. This is an approximate cartoon of its track, northern Mexico. Um, and then it did this abrupt turn to the east when it noticed the US border coming and it just decided it didn't want to go there. <laughs> so it went shh, shh, and off it went. But, but very high rainfall in, in southeastern Arizona, missing uh, Tucson, obviously, and then more effects in New Mexico and Texas. That again was an interesting one because it was really this interaction with the topography, the complex topography here that caused it to um, both. Uh, do some interesting things with its structure that were unanticipated and directed toward the east unexpectedly. And then finally we had Simon, Major Hurricane Simon. And Simon uh, also took a very similar track to the other two, except of course Ideal went straight up here, but Norbert came out here and did this kind of turn back toward the, um, the US Southwest as well. And it did a similar thing to Norbert where it kind of dissipated here and disconnected from the cloud shield, but then the cloud shield came over to Simon and rained. Um, and so we had this, this very nice rainfall here through uh, southeastern Arizona, or southern Arizona, and then off even further into the central US. Um, a picture from, uh, I think that one's the, I can't remember that's a really tall, the Santa Cruz now. The 
there's so many pictures out there, you can Google these, they're all over the place. Um, and then just to put that in a little bit more statistical perspective, and what I've done here is because Simon uh, occurred in October, so I added October into my warm season rainfall total for 2014, even though it's not supposed to be there. And that's one point to make is that these late season TC um, landfalls can actually add to our rainfall total after the monsoon is done, which is just basically what happened here. So if you combine those three tropical cyclones together for our rainfall totals, um, we got over 50 millimetres in, in most of southern Arizona from these systems. And then the percent of the June to October rainfall for 2014, again, between 20 and 40 percent of our warm season rainfall, including October, um, due to just to these tropical cyclones. So they're a very important part of our, our rainfall in the southwest US, and that's sort of the, one of the points that I really wanted to make today. Summary, quick one. So the rainfall associated with these remnants is extremely important for our, our water climatology. 2014 is still a very active year, and it's not done yet. It's an indicator that we may be back on the upswing for the eastern North Pacific in terms of tropical cyclone activity, after we've been in quite a lull actually for quite a long time. And then TC remnants this year have contributed to at least 20 to 40 percent of the warm season rainfall in southern Arizona, depending on exactly where you live in, in southern Arizona. And with that, I'll say thank you, and I'm happy to entertain any questions about anything.